Let the Punishment Fit the Crime starts this season's sentence with a scream. Directed by Russell Mulcahy, written by Ron Finley, and shot by Rick Boda. Based on a story from The Vault of Horror number 33, drawn by Jack Davis. You don't want to get caught on the wrong side of this law. Five children carry a coffin down the street. Mr. Coots spots them while gardening. He and his wife think it's cute the kids are putting on a funeral. They must have found a dead dog and want to give it a proper burial. Their neighbor, Herbert the Undertaker, is astonished the children have gone through with their plan. They visited him earlier, asking how to hold a funeral. He was happy to answer, but didn't think they were serious. Out-of-town lawyer Geraldine is in trouble for a traffic ticket. She waits her turn in the small-town courthouse. Listen, I'm stuck in some chicken shit speed trap upstate. Where the hell are you? What's the name of this burg? Stooksville. Stooksville. Never heard of it. Of course, Stooksville. <laughs> yeah. Are oh, you ready for this? Driving an improperly licensed vehicle. Oh come on. Yeah, well I'm stuck here another hour, an hour and a half, so you better meet me at the garden, what? section eight. All right, all right. What about dinner? Yeah, we'll get something to eat later. I'm starving now. Uh, you'll survive. I gotta go. Geraldine can't resist an opportunity to exploit a person's injuries. Somebody is called to courtroom B. He does not want to go. Not B. No! Not courtroom B! Please! Please, no! No! Not courtroom B! No! 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 What was that all about? Geraldine talks to a sniffling car salesman, hoping for prison time. This town's judges are tough. He's called to courtroom A. Dr. Stacy notices the funeral. The kids asked him questions too, like how can they tell if something is actually dead? Stacy asks Herbert what the kids are burying. He's not so sure that it is in fact a dog. Frank, the candy store owner, chimes in. He calls the kids morbid for their interest in death. Stacy insists a curiosity of death is natural. Frank rebuttals the children are not interested in natural death, but violent death. The other day in his store, those very same kids were ecstatic to see a newspaper headline about a murderer executed in the electric chair. Geraldine studies a photograph of a public hanging in the town. A modern car is in the picture. Public defender Austin Haggard introduces himself. Geraldine finds this laughable, only wanting to plead guilty to her small offense and be on her way. Haggard thinks that's a bad idea. Before he can explain, he is summoned to courtroom B. Geraldine is at last called to courtroom A. George the electrician adds his piece to the story. The kids brought him the newspaper, wanting to know how exactly the electric chair kills people. Of course, like the others, he indulged. Mrs. Pretty, their teacher, walks by. George tells her about the funeral for the alleged dog. The kids brought the newspaper to her class, wondering why a criminal was sentenced to death. She teaches them about capital punishment. The kids keep asking questions about the law, but she's no lawyer. Attorney Cy Shuster picks up where Mrs. Pretty leaves off. Geraldine enters the courtroom in time to see the sniffling salesman dragged away. The judge asks for her plea. When Haggard joins the hearing, he talked the judge into decreased charges. What's it gonna cost me? Ten. All this bullshit for ten bucks? Here, keep the change. Not ten dollars, Miss Ferret. Ten lashes. They can flail you now and you can be on your way. Yeah, as soon as you regain consciousness, of course. What the hell? With this information in mind, Geraldine pleads not guilty. The prosecutor enters his evidence. Geraldine's car illegally sports a license plate with only five digits, a number reserved for local governments. Haggard bolts out of the room. Geraldine argues the space counts as a sixth digit. Haggard returns with evidence as to his client's honorable character. The judge does not see it that way. I know exactly what your client is, a cynical and immoral woman. A discredit to her profession, she's lucky I don't charge her for illegal solicitation of services for this. This snotty license plate. 
found guilty, Geraldine is sentenced to 100 lashes. On her way to her punishment, she sees the sniffling, now crying salesman. They cut off his nose. Geraldine is mortified. Haggard to the rescue, the judge bought her six-digit case after all. Sai explained what crimes are punishable by death, like murder, sometimes kidnapping. The neighborhood watches the kids lower the coffin into a freshly dug hole. They think it's cute how serious the children are. Sai tells Judge Delaney that kids can be strange sometimes. The judge had his own run-in with the kids, too. They asked him about jury trials. On her way out, Geraldine is stopped and thrown into courtroom B. That guy she gave her card to earlier had already retained counsel. The judge is the much stricter brother of courtroom A's judge. Haggard pleads not guilty on Geraldine's behalf due to temporary insanity brought on by repressed childhood trauma. The judge gets medieval on Geraldine, sentencing her to be pilloried for one year. She hallucinates those suffering from her devious law practices, taunting her. Haggard interrupts with news of her appeal. In courtroom C, the strictest judge of all does not grant that appeal. However, feels the other judge's sentencing wasn't right. However, the, uh, the sentence handed down by my colleague was wholly inappropriate. <laughs> Uh, I sentence you to death by electrocution. <laughs> sentence to be carried out immediately. Your Honor, begging the court's pardon, may I approach the bench? Oh, very well. Haggard approaches the bench. He gets Geraldine a public service sentence. Heading out, Haggard hops into the electric chair. He's finally free. Geraldine is the town's new public defender. As everyone watches the kids bury the coffin, Mrs. Phillips comes running, calling her son, Freddy. Sai and the judge are confused. Isn't Freddy with the rest of the kids? No. The frantic mother explains that Freddy took something from one of the other kids and they never forgave him. The judge puts two and two together. The kids took what Sai told them about kidnapping to heart. Freddy took Emma Lou's doll and refused to give it back. That is no dog in the coffin. Despite being completely different stories, both iterations of Let the Punishment Fit the Crime have a repetitive formula, but that repetition fits like a perfect noose around the neck. The comic features a neighborhood taking turns piecing together a story, while the show pulls Geraldine to courtroom after courtroom. I had a lot of fun following the small town grapevine in the original. Each neighbor adds to the mystery of what exactly is going on with the children-led funeral. These children are not your typical creepy kids. There's nothing supernatural or unsettling about their demeanor. They are curious children who exact justice based on the grown-up's teachings. The episode's judicial system is wacky, but my goodness, the barrage of courtrooms and punishments replicates the dizziness of dealing with bureaucracy, doesn't it? Catherine O'Hara plays such a slimy lawyer, but I also relate to the bind she's in. Each version has its own Easter eggs. A copy of Mad Magazine, another EC publication, sits on the news rack in the candy store from the comic. In the show, Scott Nimmerfro, one of the series writers, is called on the loudspeaker. We also see a mid-1990s CGI cut-off nose. It kind of floats on the guy's face, but hey, they tried. The verdict is in. Both versions of Let the Punishment Fit the Crime are guilty of being entertaining. Ah, <laughs> oh, what are you crying about? They cut off my nose! 